Good morning. morning. We want to welcome each one here this morning, especially those visiting with us. It's good to be here on a bright, sunshiny morning. And it's good that we can come together as God's people to worship and to praise him. We especially want to remember the Brenner family this morning and the loss of their son and also for the community, um, for his classmates in school. We know that we don't go in our own strength, but by the grace of God. For our call to worship this morning, we turn in our bulletins, and it comes to us from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. I am so confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And we begin our worship this morning by turning to number 11 in our hymn books, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. us this morning in these words, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ, his only Son, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, amen. And our God having greeted us, let's take a moment to greet each other. Good morning, Carl. Good, how about you? Good morning. 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 Good
morning, Nadia. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good morning, Kay. Good morning. 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 Oh, 
the kingdoms far, seeing the near and far, your force of power can stop, your beauty changing hearts, you much more than this, awake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with the strength and love of God. We are the hope on earth. The kingdom here, let the darkness be. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. You may be seated, and thank you ladies for leading us in song this morning. For our guide for living this morning, we turn to a responsive reading of the law as a rule of gratitude. Hear, O people of God, the law which the Lord speaks in your hearing this day, that you may know his statutes and walk according to his ordinances. The God who saved us in Jesus Christ gave this law, saying, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. We will worship the Lord our God and serve only him. You shall not make yourself an image of anything to worship it. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. You shall observe the Sabbath by keeping it holy, for in six days you shall labor and do all your work. The first part of the law is this great commandment. The second part of the law is similar to the first. You shall honor your father and your mother, that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving to you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. <laughs> you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Thus we must love our neighbor as ourselves. And we know that's something we all struggle with as to love our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And yet we know that God offers forgiveness 
through his Son, Jesus Christ. And shall we go to him in our prayers at this time. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you in this morning, and we thank you, Lord, that you are God, and that you are in control, that you made this world and everything in it, and you keep it all in order. And Lord, even when we fell into sin, you still loved us so much and desired a relationship with your people that you sent your Son into this world to become one of us, that we may be made right with you. And yet, Lord, we live in a world that's stained by sin, and we struggle daily to live according to your will, to be the people you called us to be. Lord, we see much hurt and suffering. We are reminded this week how much this world and us people are flawed and how much we hurt. Lord, we pray that you will especially be with the, the Brenner family, with the friends and family of Tyson, with the school, with the community. Lord, we don't understand why. And yet, Lord, we pray that you will bless and comfort, that you will hold up the Brenner family, and that you will give them grace through the days that lie ahead. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you, and we can call on you, and you hear us, and you carry us, even when we can't keep going ourselves. We pray, too, for others who are are struggling, for those who are dealing with the loss of loved ones. We ask, Lord, that you continue to be with the Buck family. We pray that you will especially be with Dan and that you will give him what he stands in need of. We pray, too, that you will be with Roke and that you will bless him and give him strength for each day. We ask, Lord, too, that you will be with with Jean and give her strength. Or sometimes we wonder why. Why we must go through the things that we do. Why we, we must get diseases. Why our bodies get weak. And yet, Lord, we know that even in the difficulty, you can accomplish a purpose and you can use us to be a blessing. You can place us around people who need our encouragement or who can encourage us. And Lord, help us to see those around us as a blessing from you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that you, your mercies are new every morning. And some days the wind howls quite strong and the rain seems to drive through us. But Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you that you give us new days and you give us something to hope for. You give us something beyond this life. Because of Jesus Christ, we can anticipate eternal life where there is no pain, no suffering, no hurt, no sorrows, no growing old but we will forever be with you where there is none of these problems, but simply joy. And Lord, we thank you that Jesus give, came to this world and took upon himself our sufferings so that we can anticipate that. We ask, Lord, that you will be with our country. Lord, you know the struggles it's going through, and we ask that your spirit may rest on your people, and that we may have that spirit of loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbors as ourselves, that we may have a spirit of unity and peace. We ask that you will be with our president, with the Congress. We ask that you will give that to them. We ask that you will help us be the people you call us to be. We pray that you will be with people of every nation, Lord. 
We thank you that you make us each in your image. And we ask, Lord, that you will be with your church. We ask that you will be with those who bring your word to people in difficult places who are living with hard circumstances. And we ask that by seeing who you are and what it is you've done for us, they may find hope. Lord, we thank you that you give us your word, that we can look at it this morning. And we ask that you will speak to us by your spirit and that we may be drawn closer to you, that we may be the people you call us to be, and that you may be praised through us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we ask the children to come forward for our children's message. It's good to see you all here in this morning. You know, I've been coming here a few years, and when I first started coming, some of you weren't very big. Um, in fact, I remember the first time I preached in Grandview, it was in the old church yet, um, Isabella got baptized um, that Sunday. So you've grown a bit since then. Um, and how do you suppose you got from being these little babies to getting bigger and getting stronger? You run races, and you do very good at that. You play football. You do swimming. You do all sorts of activities. How is it you go from being little to getting bigger and getting stronger? You eat. You're right. You eat. So do you just sit and eat every day, all day long? No. What else do you do? You lift weights, you run around, you exercise, don't you? And you work at it. Um, some of those of you who are involved in sports, you have coaches who help train you to get stronger and better at what you do. So you don't just, but you need to eat, you need to rest, and you need to exercise, and it all comes together. And as you get older, you learn to manage that a little better. You can't just sit and eat. Even though we sometimes like doing that, don't we? I enjoy doing that too much, I agree. But, um, but we need a little more than just sitting and eating. And we come to church and we get fed. We get fed God's word. And then we have to go out and put it into practice. And sometimes that's the work of it. Because we talked about loving our neighbors as ourselves, but sometimes we think God really don't know our neighbors that well. Um, and yet we're called to do that. And it takes work to be able to do it. And I brought something for you this morning. Something to help you make, sh make you stronger. Y you're, you're right, you know me well. <laughs> it's cheese. And cheese will help make you stronger, help make your bones stronger, your teeth stronger. But you're going to have to go out and work at it. Um, and that's the way our lives are. God gives us what we talked about last week, our daily bread. 
but then we have to go out and work at it. And we trust him to make us stronger, to give us strength for each day. So thanks for coming up this morning. For our scripture, at this time we're going to have special music. Oh my. Michaela is going to sing for us. I'm glad we remembered that.
Thank you, Michaela. And we remember that our help comes in the name of the Lord who rescues us. For our scripture this morning, we turn again to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 17. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Walk on ahead of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Mesa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites tomorrow. I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Ur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, for hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against Amalek, against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Then we turn also to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll read the first eight verses. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. 
Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of the Lord, and may God add his blessing to it. It said that life is a battle, it's a struggle. It's a fight. I remember a number of years ago, they were having a celebration in Korska. I think it was probably on the 4th of July. And they dug this pit and they filled it with water and they turned three pigs loose in that pen. Um, They probably weighed close to 100 pounds. And they had three teams of three guys get in the pen with the pigs. And the goal was to take the pig and set them butt first into this 50 gallon barrel. It seemed like a fun thing to do. I remember one of the teams, the guys came dressed up in three-piece suits. And it was a challenge to get the pig caught, first of all, and then to try to stick him in the barrel. But the thing was, you weren't just working to try to catch the pig, because the other teams, if they saw you were getting close, would play defense and they would tackle them into the mud. It was a fight. Needless to say, sometimes our lives can seem that way, don't it? We can think that we've got a goal that we need to reach, and it can be challenging in itself, but not only that, there's those who are fighting against us trying to bury us in the mud of life. As we look at this book of Exodus, the people of Israel are on a journey, and it seems like it's almost like a roller coaster ride where they're on top of the mountain one day, and a little bit later they're in the bottom, in a valley. They came through the Red Sea. God parted it for them. They walked through on dry ground. He drowned their enemies. And they sang praises to the Lord. And then they start the journey and there's no water. And then when they find water, it's bitter. And God has Moses put a stick in it and it turns sweet for them. And then they go a little further and there's no food. And God sends manna and quail. He gives them an oasis to rest in. And they journey. And now again, there's no water. And they go back to their old habit of grumbling and complaining against Moses. It was a problem. There's no doubt about that. But what good would it do to grumble and complain against Moses? Moses was called by God to lead the people, yes. But Moses himself didn't provide the water. And sometimes we grumble and complain too, do we not? When things get hard. When there's too much water, when there's not enough water, when school is hard, and what good does it do? What good does it do to grumble and complain? I remember Doris Marcus, sister of Clarice de Vries, saying her her dad would say, complaining does you no good. 
It does you no good. It just makes you tired and weary. And if you think of soldiers being trained for battle, and just perhaps you're told you need to do push-ups, and you do about all the push-ups you can do, and you run all the miles you think you can do, what good does it do to complain to the drill sergeant, you're being too hard on us? For those who are in the military, I think they know better than to do that. I recently heard of a young man who, who went to basic training, and when he graduated, his last name was Boss, and they announced him as Bass. And his parents were a little disgusted about that. They said, why didn't you correct him? No. <laughs> we saw guys do that. It's not worth it. <laughs> and to grumble and complain to a drill sergeant isn't worth it, even if they've maybe gone a bit overboard. And for those involved in athletics, if you've been given a very hard workout and you start to grumble against the coach, it usually doesn't do much good. You find yourself having to work even harder. And the Israelites were being trained. They were being trained to journey to the promised land and they would have lots of struggles along the way and so God had them go without water for a while to develop a patience, to develop a trust in him. And grumbling wasn't doing any good. And being disgusted with their leader did them no good. In fact, they would have done well to go to Moses and say, we are without water, but what is it we can do to help get through this situation. Can we pray for you, Moses? See, it's good to encourage our leaders who've been placed over us by God. Oftentimes when problems come, we forget to pray. We forget to look that there's more to this than just our problem. Often we focus too much on just us and not on the bigger picture, on what God may be trying to do. God was giving them strength, endurance for something that would follow. See, a battle was coming. A battle was coming and they would need to be able to endure through that. And when God had them go without water, he wasn't trying to kill them. He was just trying to make them a little stronger, perhaps physically, and also in their faith and trust in him that he would be with them through the struggles of life. See, this book of Exodus resembles much the plan of salvation. And you and I, too, are on a journey. And there's times where we can feel like we're being tried more than we can bear. There's times where we may feel thirsty so that we can hardly keep going. And we remember, we remember that our Savior hung on a cross and he said, I thirst. I thirst. He suffered like we do. And yet he was doing the will of his Father. And there's times where we can seem like we're being dried up almost. And yet we're called 
to do the will of our Heavenly Father. The Israelites were on a journey, and so are we, to a better place. But along the way, we're going to face battles. And the next battle the Israelites would face was the Amalekites. And the Amalekites were descendants of a guy named Amalek, who was a grandson of Esau 400 years earlier. And the Amalekites, just as Jacob and Esau had their fights, the Amalekites now would fight with the Israelites. And it would be easy for the Israelites to complain. And yet, they were the chosen people, were they not? Just as Jacob was chosen over Esau. And sometimes we live in a world where there's those who oppose us in our faith. And it would be easy to grumble and complain, and yet we can be thankful. We can be thankful that we're chosen by God to know how much he loves us, that he saves us from our sins. And yet sometimes we're attacked, are we not? And the Israelites were being attacked, and there's a time for war and a time for peace. And this was a time for war, and God tells Moses to tell Joshua to prepare men to fight. And I think we sometimes forget how many people there were. About two and a half million Israelites. About 600,000 men. This wasn't a small army. And they weren't experienced in fighting. And they'd have to go out and fight the Amalekites. But they do. They go out to fight. And Moses goes to the top of the hill because they were asked to be faithful. But the victory wouldn't come from themselves. Victory would come from God. And so Moses holds up his hands and calls out to God. He looks to God for blessing on the Israelite army. And when he holds up his hands, the blessings come down and the Israelites are winning. But Moses isn't a young man anymore. He's 80 years old. And even if he was young, to hold up your hands all day would get tiring. I remember playing basketball, and we had a coach who was diligent in training us. And he required us to shuffle, to play defense with your hands up. He used to have that chant, hands up, defense. And he said, a game is 32 minutes long, and you should be able to shuffle 32 minutes with your hands up. Eventually, our hands would start to get tired. We would want to grumble and complain, but knew better. We were being trained. Moses had his hands up, calling on God for blessing on the people. And God was blessing as Moses looked to him. But his arms began to get tired. Sometimes we get tired, do we not? Sometimes leaders can get tired. And Aaron and Ur, they see the problem. And they have Moses sit on a rock and they get next to him and they hold his hands up. They hold his hands up so that the people can be blessed. Because blessing came from God. And you and I do well to look to God for our blessings. Sometimes I think we live in a country where we think it should be provided by the government. And maybe God wants us to do a little something ourselves. He wants us to be diligent, remembering the blessing will come from him. We're called to work hard. But remember, we don't make it happen. It's God who makes it happen. And God would provide a victory 
for these people. They were called to be diligent, but God would give the victory. We all face battles. Battles of one kind or another. And we remember that we're called to be diligent. To do our best. But it's God who makes it happen. As we look at Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy, he's encouraging a young Timothy to be faithful to do his best in life, to do the best, filling a spot that Paul had had. He says, preach the word in season and out of season. Be prepared. Correct those who are erring. Rebuke them if necessary. Encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Do your best, Timothy. He said a time is coming when people won't put up with sound instruction, but will find someone to say whatever they want to say. We kind of live in that type of world too, don't we? Whether it be with our health care, Um, Sometimes you have that. You know, you go to a doctor and they say, um, you know, to get well, you really should do this. I can almost tell you, if I went to the doctor, they say, you want to be better? Lose a little weight. Get on an exercise program. Watch what you eat. But we think, boy, there's a better doctor than that, isn't there? (laughs) I'll go to another guy. (laughs) He'll give me um, better news. We come to church and we have God's word for us. And it tells us how to live. But surely there's a better way than that. We like to do it our way. And Paul tells Timothy, you're going to face people who think that way. And you need to be firm with them and yet patient. And it's a struggle. Keep your head to you, Timothy. Keep your head in these situations. Do your work diligently. Remember. Remember you're going to a better place and you're called to be faithful for a little while. We sing that song, We're Marching to Zion. And we're on a journey. Just as the Israelites were on a journey to the promised land, we too are on a journey to a promised land. And it isn't always easy. It's a challenge. It's a struggle. And we're called to be faithful. We forget sometimes this world isn't our eternal home. We're going to a better place. We're just passing through. And on the way, On the way, we're going to get dirty sometimes. It's kind of like the guys trying to put the pig in the barrel. You're going to do that game. You're going to get dirty. And living in a sinful world, we're going to, at times, slip and fall. We're going to have to contend with a world that doesn't always appreciate Christianity. We're going to get knocked down. We must remember. We must remember where the goal is and to keep fighting the fight. I remember quite a few years ago, I was trying to encourage a man who was struggling very much. And I went to the hardware, not the hardware store, the drug store in Korska then. It used to be a gift shop too. And I found a plaque there. 
and it had a poem on it I'd like to read for you. It's entitled, Don't You Quit. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when funds are low and deaths are high, and you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learn, and many a fellow turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow, you may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night came down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out the silver tint in the clouds of doubt, and you never can tell how close you are. It might be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when you're hardest hit. It's when things seem worse, you must not quit. And Paul was writing to Timothy and encouraging him, keep on. Keep on fighting the fight. And Paul could say it from experience because Paul himself had been rejected. He had been cast out of churches in many places. He had been put in prison. He had been stoned. And he kept on keeping on, not by himself, but by the strength of God. And you and I are called to do the same. We're called to give it our best when it seems like more than we can take. We remember that Jesus himself came, came and fought a fight that he didn't want to. He gave it his all, and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He died for you and me. He finished a fight that we couldn't fight. And so no matter what we go through in life, we've already been given the victory. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But the battle's in the Lord's hands. And he won it for us. And if we look to him, we can find strength to make it one day at a time to the final goal. May God give us the grace to look to him this day as we anticipate eternity. A promised land. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you this morning, and Lord, we confess we're quick to grumble and complain, to feel sorry for ourselves when life gets hard. Lord, help us to remember how much you've done for us. Help us to fix our eyes on you. Help us to remember others who went through very difficult times and how you bless them in the midst of difficulty as they look to you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that our eternal destiny does not depend on us. You've done that for us in Jesus Christ. But you call us to be faithful and to follow where you lead. Lord, may your spirit rest upon us 
and give us the grace to do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us stand and profess what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and while our offerings are being received, we'll sing the first three stanzas of number 151, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. unto you in this morning, and we thank you for blessing us so richly, for giving us far more than we need or deserve. We thank you for an opportunity to give back 
a portion of what you've blessed us with, and we ask that you will multiply it, that you will use it for the furtherance of your kingdom, that you will use your church here on earth, that you will make it strong, and that it will touch the hearts and lives of many with your love, mercy, and grace, and that through your church, people may see Jesus. They may see you and find hope for salvation, for eternal life. Amen. For our benediction this morning, we turn to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, where it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. For our closing song this morning, we sing number 732, The Battle Belongs to the Lord. army will enter the line the battle belongs to the Lord no weapon that's fashioned against us will stand the battle belongs to the Lord and we sing glory honor power and strength to the Lord we sing glory strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, Power and strength to the Lord, we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in hard, do not fear, the battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord.